So we were listening to a little song here called The Battle of Blair Mountain. Let so me just play it again for us. We, we can just um, listen to it together. It's really nice. I wrote with my friend Mike Richardson, who's from Southern West Virginia, and it's about I wish they had the lyrics, but they don't, unfortunately. So we'll just have to enjoy listening to it. Mountain. Let's let's listen to this song together. For those who didn't hear it already, because this is what we're going to be talking about today, or rather, one of the things we're going to be talking about today is the Battle of Blair Mountain, one of the most favorite, one of the most famous um, labor conflicts in the history of America that almost no one knows about. Weird how that works, isn't it? Yeah, coal mining. Yep, we're going to talk about mining coal. We're going to talk about labor. We're going to talk about working hard. Drain the black gold. Many of you who are in chat right now Open probably worked hard very recently. That you probably work hard every single day. And if you work, if you've ever worked, you have been exploited. You've been exploited by the capitalist class. And we're going to talk about some of that. We're going to talk about how that all ties into stuff that's still going on today. It's really interesting. You might find that you learn a lot of interesting stuff. Empowering stuff, in fact. Mine owner's mercy. Oh yes, we will be. As a grave, in shanty towns. We ain't We're gonna talk about all that. Say. The Fourteen hour shifts, such a meager wage. And Mother Jones can't help us now anyway. Mother Jones was one of the leading yeah, members anyway. of the IWW. Industrial the workers of the world. Take the trees by she also had glasses very similar to mine, which I didn't know until I'm recently. Same style. Lay down your Bibles, take up your guns, Blair Mountain. Yeah, Woody Blair. Guthrie, yep. Here we come. You have a banjo that says this machine oh, kills fascists? Amazing. It does. As it turns out, art is really, really, really good at fighting certain aspects of fascism. Because art brings us together. It, it bonds us to other people with different walks of life. It is, I agree. We're the rednecks of the Union, 1921. Ooh. That sucks, Cash McCrash. But whatever, it's in better hands now. The Banjo is one of the instruments I would love to learn, take the roads, but I don't have take one. The I don't have access to any instruments other than my piano right now. Hey, guy, no type. Good to see you. How you doing? You're gay? Me too. I bet there's a lot of people in chat who are gay. Whether you're gay or not, let's get some gay pride in here. Let's get some gay and trans pride. Let's get it in the chat. And then we'll get into all this. Solidarity is a powerful force. We're soldiers of a great war and it don't seem right to treat a man There we go. Just to make a dime. Just to make a dime. We'll take the roads, we'll take the trains by force. Oh, deliver us love from the gathering stores. Beautiful. Look at all those hearts. Lay down your Bibles, yeah. take up your guns. Blair Melton, here we come. Oh. That's true. He did. Kurt Cobain had a golden heart. So find a vein, drain the black gold. You better hope to God that those timbers hold. Yeah, wonderful. Good song, huh? So, let's start things off. Why on earth 
are we talking about Blair Mountain today? Well, if you'll join me, we're going to go on a tiny bit of an adventure first, before we talk about all this history that I've been talking about. Let me just start us off. You all may have heard of a shooting that occurred a couple of days ago. Maybe. Did you hear about uh, a shooting in Denver at a protest? I wouldn't blame you if you hadn't, but a lot of people did. Um, a lot of people, in fact, heard that it was a, a member of Antifa who did the shooting. Um, but as it turns out, it was not an Antifa member who did this shooting. In fact, it couldn't be further from that. Let me just get this camera up a little bigger since we're uh, we're not on a panel today. We're just, it's just, it's just us. Yes, indeed, Atono no Aji. It was indeed a Pinkerton, which is a little strange because you might look at your calendar and go, wait a minute, isn't it 2020? Or you might just say, what the fuck is a Pinkerton? I'm going to tell you about that. So first, let's just get the facts straight. You know, now that it's been a few days, let's get the facts straight. One person died and another was taken into custody after a shooting near dueling protests in Denver on Saturday. The shooting occurred in an area near a planned police support rally. One of those um, back the blue rallies. Yeah, <laughs> you might have thought that, Kevin or Louie, but it couldn't be further from the truth, unfortunately. Oh, yes. Um, I believe they were once referred to, uh, the Pinkertons were once referred to as turds in the ass of America. Uh, unironically. Unironically, um, that was a a a, slow, a line that was used against the Pinkertons at one point. Um, uh, let's just take a look here. So there was a back the blue protest, and a counter protest showed up, and of course, you know, they yelled back and forth, and then there was an altercation. There was a uh, somebody sprayed bear mace at someone, and then someone else shot someone else. Let's find out some more. Denver police said in a tweet that the suspect is Matthew Doloff, 30, a private security guard with no t affiliation to Antifa. You, you might be like, what the fuck? Why the fuck did they even need to say that? Why do they need to say with no affiliation to Antifa? Well, as it turns out, the Denver police initially reported that the guy had ties to Antifa with no evidence whatsoever. And what happened after that? Well, you might be able to guess. We saw some very familiar faces appear on the timeline. Let me just bring these up, and let me just show you what happened in the aftermath to this shooting. Uh, he has, like, some random video game tattoo, and, yeah, it's completely dumb. Wait, where'd my... Oh, no, my link. My link broke. Let me get my link. Here's the link. Boop. Can my link work, please? I would really like my link to work. There we go. Let me just bring this up. Let me just show you what happened. So, further investigation has determined the suspect is a private security guard with no affiliation to Antifa. Additional information will be released as it becomes available. Ah, yes, we're about to get to that, Kevin or Louie. Paul Joseph Watson. It appears as though a far-left Antifa radical just shot and killed a Trump supporter in Denver. The shooter in Denver was a left-wing protester. He shot and killed a patriot. Andy Neo, a left-wing protester at an Antifa Denver rally, shot and killed a conservative participant of the Patriot rally. This follows the August killing of a Trump supporter. Raheem Kassam. And also, uh, somewhere in here is Tim Pools. Let me just see if I can get the Tim Pool one. Because we did get a, uh, we did get a Tim Pool. I thought it was in this tweet, but I guess the Tim Pool one specifically isn't. Yeah, here we go. Here we go. Take a look at this. Holy fuck. He posts the post-millennial. <laughs> Holy fuck. The post-millennial. Breaking. Alleged Antifa militant shoots and kills conservative at the Patriot Rally in Denver. This was all put out, you know, moments. Like, within within hours after. Isn't uh, Andy Neo Canadian? No, I don't think he is. I believe he lives here in the U.S., if I'm not mistaken. Um... They showed it next to some weird Space Invader meme. Yeah, Tim Pool covered this horrifically. In fact, I don't even know. Maybe he did a video on it. Did he do a video on it? I didn't check that. Um, oh, the tweets are still live. Now, he did make a correction, just so you know. 
Um, Tim Pool did indeed make a correction. Not all of them did, but Tim Pool did make a correction. Let me just uh, let me just show you if let me see if I can find it right here. Here we go. Here's the one. Thank you, Carlos Maza. Right here. Holy fuck. 3,000, 3.6 thousand retweets, 8,000 likes, 819 comments, right? Here's the correction. The correction, three, uh, 53 retweets, 283 likes. Still left up the original tweet. Still left up the original article that was, that was written by the fucking post-millennial right-wing rag alleging this information based on nothing. Based on jack shit. So, who was the actual shooter? Hmm. Let's find out. Ah, here we go. The private security guard was contracted through Pinkerton by Nine News. Hmm. Hmm. It has been the practice of Nine News for a number of months to hire private security to accompany staff at any protest, KUSA reported. DPD originally took two people into custody and later found the second individual, a Nine News producer who works in the investigative unit, was not involved in the incident at all. The producer is no longer in police custody and is not a suspect. Strange, that. Strange how that works out. Really strange. Yeah, see, what you're supposed to do, though, Atona no Aji, is you're supposed to make a correction. You either delete the tweet and make a new one so it stops spreading, or you make an entirely new tweet retweeting the original so that people see it on your main timeline. Do I think it's irresponsible to bring a gun to a protest? I feel torn on the issue. We can talk about that, actually. We can actually, let me just, let me just, actually, you know what? I'll answer that right now. Here's my thoughts on it. If you're going to bring a gun to a protest, you'd better know what the fuck you're doing and you'd better be doing it with other people. Because if it's an organized thing, like say you have an organization that you're going with, like the Black Panthers or something like that, and you all show up with guns and you're using them responsibly and you're showing that you're not just brandishing them, but rather displaying your constitutional right to bear arms, that's fine. If you just bring a gun to a protest, you could be putting yourself in a lot of danger because as as you can imagine, guns tend to escalate things a little bit. If you show up with a gun and you're not careful with it, you could end up getting shot because people will be more scared around you with a gun if you're displaying it openly. Also, like it or not, there is a chance that that gun will be used against you. You might be photographed with that gun and framed in one way or another. Um, and, or you could have the police crack down on you because you have that gun. So while I very much believe that people should be armed, when you're going to a protest, you should be very careful about that decision. And you should make sure that you're doing so with a lot of consideration and know what you're actually doing. We can't just have people going out to protest with firearms. It's very dangerous. There are crowds of people. And if you don't know how to take care of a gun responsibly, you could be putting yourself and other people at danger. So I don't think that it's outright irresponsible. I think that it should be done carefully and should be done with organization. Don't go it alone, basically. That's the, that's my take on it is don't do these things alone and don't do so irresponsible. Don't do so without taking the necessary um, preparations. Hey, Under the Thunder. Hey, Cosmic Sean. We're talking, right now, we're talking about the Pinkertons. And we, for a second, took a little bit of a sidestep into talking about whether it's responsible to bring guns to protests or not. There are very legitimate reasons to bring a gun to a protest. For example, self-defense. If you're going to a counter-protest against a known violent group, having a gun there may literally save your life. But there's also the chance that it could make things worse because people see you with a gun, they panic, they start firing, the crowd goes insane, there's wild shit happens. So you have to do this this sort of thing very carefully and you need to do so very responsibly. While I wouldn't say it's irresponsible to bring a gun outright, it should be done with utmost care. That's what I will say. That's my opinion on it. Um, and of course you should always, you should absolutely always do so legally within the bounds of your state because otherwise you're just inviting more problems to the protest. The thing is, 
there have been protests in the past with lots of legally armed people, and they've been successful. But it ha again, it has to be done with preparation and organization. There has to be um, solidarity and unity there. Otherwise, you could just come off as some fucked up crazy militia that's going out there and people could take it like that. Because, like it or not, a gun is a lethal weapon. It is a weapon. It can be used for self-defense, but it is nonetheless a weapon. So, yeah. Well, uh, I'm glad your tweet blew up. Uh, the TERFs will almost always find it, unfortunately. Um, we have to deal with that all the time. Um, they are all over the internet, and they like to argue and say stupid shit, as it turns out. So, to to jump back to the whole thing, let's let's give a quick summary. Protest in Denver, back the blue. Counter-protest showed up. They start yelling at each other. One of the black, the back the blue people and a security guard get in some kind of an altercation and the security guard, pop, gets the guy. The security guard works for a firm called the Pinkertons. And again, we might be here, um, you know, we might be here um, saying, God, the Pinkertons in 2020? Oh my God, if you know who the Pinkertons are, you might be like, I didn't even know they were around. As it turns out, they are still around. Have you ever heard of a company called Securitas? You probably have. Anybody in chat? Uh, in fact, maybe one of you worked for it. Let's take a look. You've probably seen Securitas. They have a little logo that looks like this. Let me just uh, bring it up here. You've probably seen this logo around. You've probably seen their cars driving around town. You've probably seen them at your local mall. Securitas is a huge security firm, and they own the Pinkertons. They bought the Pinkertons some time back. And yes, the Pinkertons are still operating. Yes, they are. As a matter of fact, I am surprised the Pinkertons still exist. They do. They are they are owned by Securitas. These guys who are a global security firm, private security firm, they work at lots of malls in America. They work at lots of concerts. You've probably seen them all over the place. Let's see if I can find a... Uh, let me just see if I can find us a, a picture of a Securitas guard so we can get an idea of what their uniforms look like. Let's see. I think I can find one here. Let's let's get a look. Here we go. Here we go. You've probably seen these guys around. You know, the Rent-A-Cops. You know, that sort of thing. We got, you know, we got a nice picture. You got your Securitas gray uniform with the little, little hyper-militarized things. Yeah, you were a security person for them um, after the arm after you got out of the army. A lot of people have probably worked with Securitas. Securitas owns the Pinkertons. The Pinkertons now, however, go by a little bit of a different name. They don't really they don't call themselves what they used to call themselves, which was they used to call themselves the Pinkertons, the uh, Pinkertons Detective Agency. Um, now. Um, they are known as Pinkerton's Consulting and Investigations or the Pinkerton Corporate Risk Management. You see, there's this whole thing where private security has gotten a really, really, really bad name over the last few years. Oh, we're going to talk about who the Pinkertons are. We're doing that right now. So I'm going to teach you about the Pinkertons. The Pinkertons, again, now they go by the term Pinkerton Corporate Risk Management or Pinkerton Consulting and Investigations, because that's what private security is now. Risk management, um, consulting and investigations, they hide their name under this. And you might be wondering, why the fuck do security companies have to hide their names um, and, and call themselves risk management and all kinds of stuff like that? There, rakasan has got it. It's because they have a terrible, terrible reputation as being union busters. And as it turns out, it's really, really bloody. So let's talk about the Pinkertons. The Pinkertons, their uh, motto was, we never sleep. Oh, you do? Okay. Well, Gina, um, I am happy to have you here lurking. If you need anything from me, ping me, all right? And I'll try and do my best to, to help you out. And I'm happy to have you here today. The Pinkertons used the motto, we never sleep. And in fact, they used to have a really, uh, oh, this really great um, icon. Let me just bring it up real quick because it, it, it's, it's perfect. It's really perfect. Um, what's it called? Uh, icon. Yeah, let me see here if I can get it. Yeah, here we go. Here's their, here's, their, uh, here's their one. Let me just bring this up real quick. Look at this. Oh, shit, it's huge. I don't want that. There we go. Look at that. 
Look at that Pinkerton logo. It's an eyeball watching, you know? Perfect. Yeah, they're a private contract security company. Yeah, that's exactly what they are. Um, and the thing is, the Pinkertons, the Pinkertons have done a lot of stuff in American history. They've been around a hell of a long time. They were founded... Um, they were founded in 1850. They've been around forever. Yeah, look at that. It's like an eyeball. Yeah, the hyper reveal. Sure looks a lot like, I mean, you know, it's like a stereotype. They've, uh, you know, they're just watching at all times. Uh, yeah, 170 years. They've been around for fucking ever. As it turns out, the private security business is hella, hella money. Pinkerton, because they always have pink eye? Maybe. Maybe. Um... Here's the thing. The Pinkertons are, little, are they're not completely unique, but they have some interesting history. For example, one of the things that they always prided um, themselves on was intelligence services. The Pinkertons were really, really good at infiltrating groups and getting information. So private companies would hire them and they would go sneak into organizations find out information, and help undermine those organizations. And you might be wondering, what type of organization would they go in? Well, the answer, as it turns out, was pretty frequently unions. Unions. That's what they usually were infiltrating, was unions. Um, yeah, mall cops, security guards, union busters. But it gets a lot worse because, you see, they were involved in a lot of really, really bad things. Hey! Been watching your stuff on YouTube, by the way. I enjoy it, and it's often too exciting for me to fall asleep after. <laughs> so I love you, but I'm gonna blame you for my sleeping schedule. Faye, very, very happy to have you. I, I definitely do some exciting content. I'm a very high energy person. Sorry you can't sleep afterwards, but I hope you've been. I'm glad you've been enjoying them, and thank you so much for the sub. I deeply, deeply appreciate it. Um, yeah. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, we're going to be doing a whole bunch of other exciting stuff today, so it'll be fun. Um, much love. Blah. Um, so yeah, the Pinkertons. So let's talk more a little bit more about this. The Pinkertons were involved. They were present at nearly every major labor conflict in American history. And if you feel like you're pulling up a blank on America, like on, oh wait, labor conflicts in America? Like, what do you mean? What do you mean by labor conflicts? When I say labor conflicts, I mean labor conflicts. Did you know we had a war? There was a war in America called the Coal War. They're sorry, the Colorado Coal War. Yeah, that's what we're talking about, Rakasan. We're talking about the Battle of Blair Mountain today. So don't you worry. You don't even have to look it up. I'm going to deliver it right to your eyeballs and earballs. You were hired by them to go into Lockheed Martin. That doesn't surprise me. Um, they work very, very closely with a whole bunch of other military industrial complex companies. Tons of them. Like, tons. It's standard. They are well known and, 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 and embed themselves in all kinds of things like this. There's all kinds of contracts binding these companies together. And they always watch out for one another's backs. And we're going to find out more about that as we go on. So if you feel like um, you didn't learn much about American labor history in your time in school, I wouldn't blame you because most people don't. Most people don't know that there were literal wars fought on American soil over labor, largely coal, steel, oil, these sort of things. And we're going to learn about a little bit of that today. For example, the first one we're just going to learn a, a, a tiny, tiny bit about. You know, we're not going to learn like a whole, we're not going to go deep into this one because the Pinkertons, honestly, were just a launching point for us to talk about this. But we're going to talk about the Homestead Strike. The Homestead Strike, which later became known as the Homestead Massacre, occurred in 1892. So a long time ago, you know, back in the ancient Egyptian times, as we like to refer to the 1800s. Um, the, uh, uh, they, they were, this was where the Pinkertons got there, got real famous on a national level because they were responsible for killing 16 people at the strike where they opened fire on striking steelworkers. They had been hired by Carnegie, by Andrew Carnegie, you know, the guy who 
owns, who set up a whole bunch of libraries all over America and was a famous philanthropist. Um, you know, the, the good oil baron or the, I guess he's not an oil baron, but the good robber baron. He was a steel guy. Um, the, he hired the Pinkertons to go in and break the strike. Kind of weird, huh? And then they went in and they broke it very violently. Again, 16 people died at that, at that strike because the Pinkertons decided to fire into the crowd. Bit wild, huh? So that's the thing. The Pinkertons, of course, were involved in all kinds of these things and, and many more than we'll ever know because a lot of these happen behind closed doors in corporate environments where there's not a matter of public record. But there are, there are some examples of public record things that have gone on in our history that we're going to talk about today. The Pinkertons don't like your family. So back in my day, my great granddad on my mom's side started the Kakuna Paper Mill Union, and you can imagine how that went. I can actually imagine how that went. Um, as it turns out, in in America, we really don't like workers, like not us, but the country, the state, the 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 general attitude towards workers is pathetically bad, um, and this has occurred because of years and years and years of indoctrination, of anti-worker propaganda, of anti-union propaganda. We've actually talked about this in the past, right? Um, has anyone here worked at a job where you, went, as a part of your training, had to watch an anti-union video? It's really, really common, actually. Um, I had to do that. In fact, it was really common. We would get an anti-union video once every quarter, every time that we would... Um, Every time that we would go to these, uh, when I worked for Best Buy, for example, we would go to these, um, like, quarterly yes, meetings. Um, is Trump going to win the election? Probably not at this point. I mean, it's possible. Anything's possible. But it's not looking like it. We can talk about that a little more after. We'll meme on some of the numbers because it's looking wild. It's not looking so good. It could be 2016, too. Maybe. Um, he didn't want to give his money to big labor. You know that union dues cost basically nothing and they give you so much. They give you so much. Countries that have high unionization have good work environments. Do you know that like in, in Scandinavian countries, these countries that we always look at for having really high quality of life, and they're still flawed. Don't get me wrong. It's not like they're a paradise. But I mean, McDonald's workers make like the, Amer the equivalent of twenty two fifty. That's wild. They get that because they have like 80% union membership among their working population. You had to watch videos on how to spot potential union activity when I worked at a man manager at McDonald's? Yep. Here in America, it's ridiculously common to look to demonize unions to an unbelievable degree. And they get in even with the lowest tier of management by convincing management that they're actually part of the team, even though you're not. When you're just a low-level manager, you are not a part of the corporation, and they will drop you the moment they can. But they convince you, and they tell you, you're a part of the team now. you got to help spot these, union, these unionizers, these people who want to ruin our workplace. And they'll tell you the wildest shit about them. I can't even remember all of the shit that was told. Like, holy fuck, I watched so many anti-union videos when I worked at Best Buy. I remember them saying, it'll ruin your pay. They'll take away your benefits. They'll make you, um, they'll trick you into paying all kinds of money into, uh, into things that do nothing for you. They just lie. They just say anything they want to try and get you to stay away from unionizing. Hey, Boycott Israel, good to see you. You work with a bunch of conservatives who bick up, bitch about our union all the time, yet they reap the benefits. That happens all the time. Part of the thing is that uh, part of the problem that's happened in the United States is that unions have become very weak and um, they've been regulated to hell and we don't actually have much union power to begin with. So there's not a whole lot of inter-union solidarity, despite the fact that union workplaces are by far the be best places to work. They're the best. You go, you work in a union workplace, you're going to have good pay, good benefits, and you're going to have protection on the job. Job was terrible, but the union was amazing. I didn't appreciate it at the time. Well, yeah, it's hard. It, it's really hard to come to appreciate something that everywhere else in your, in your country is demonized. It really is. And keep in mind, we're kind of unique as far as other countries that are like on par with us uh, as far as economics. 
we're one of the few ones that doesn't have large a large presence of unions. And as a result, we have some of the worst work standards in the entire world. Do you have you ever looked at a um a chart of like comparing America um America's um vacation days versus other countries vacation days let me see if i can find this chart i was looking at i didn't save it because i didn't know if we were going to jump into this fully but let me just let's just see um yeah here we go let's see if we can find the chart here yeah yeah here we go let's let's get let's take a look at this uh, here we go. Boop, 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 boop. This one was brought to us, uh, thanks to, uh, by, by, uh, CNBC. Here we go. Look at that. We've even got corporate, corporate news. Days of annual leave, public holidays. You got the UK. The UK is even blowing us out. 28 days of annual vacation days, nine public holidays that are guaranteed by the state. United States, 10 average and they're all public holidays. The average person here in the States gets nothing. We get no vacation time. You've worked at a, I'm sure you've worked at a job before that's like that, right? Where they either give you none or you have to work there for a year before you get any or it accrues based on the hours that you've worked. Isn't that fucked? Isn't that completely fucked that you can put your labor in for a company and they can, they can lock basic benefits like time off behind that isn't that wild yeah we don't get mandated days off barely at all some states have restrictions but most do not we don't even have um we don't even have good break time laws a lot of jobs are give you 30 minutes to to get food 30 minutes for a lunch break and there might not even be food nearby within 30 minutes, which which puts the cost on you for having to bring food to work every single day. Yeah, absolutely. I can link you to this. I can link you to this article as well. And there's more. There's better graphs. This one was just, I just grabbed right off. There's the, there's the link to the article and um, the graph. But it's a really good a little illustration that just shows how far behind we are. I mean, like, look at this, right? Like, I mean, hell. Let's just open this up again. Let me just open this up and show us. Let's take a look. Look at all of these countries. UK, France, Spain, Germany, Chile, South Korea, Australia, Japan, Israel, Canada, Mexico. Mexico's even blowing us out. And you know how, how much shit our, our politicians talk about Mexico. And we're getting blown out by Mexico. Workers here are, yeah, we're, yep, American workers get cucked, absolutely cucked by bosses here. And unions are there to cuck, to cuck you, or to uncuck you, rather. <laughs> Have you seen the Delta? Let me just bring these up. This is another good one. We're kind of on a little bit of a tangent here, but I just wanted to show you this. <laughs> here you go. This was funny. Here you go. Let me see if I can find this pamphlet real quick. This is the one with the meme in it. But um, listen, listen. This is just a meme, okay? Look, yeah, that's the one. This is the Delta one. Union dues cost around $700 a year. A new video game system with the latest hit sounds like fun. Put your money towards that instead of paying dues to the union. Ignore this one. This is just a meme over here. Don't, don't look at this one. This is a meme. This is a meme. Don't, ignore this one. You don't need to worry about this. 700 bucks a year... So you can get an Xbox this year. Woo! Do you know what these union dues will win you? They'll make sure that your family has coverage. They'll make sure that you have helmets when you're working in an, on an airline job. They'll make sure you have earplugs. They'll make sure that you're not going deaf in five years from working for Delta around engines that will blow your ears out. Yeah, it's, it's fucking wild. Yeah, you don't even need to. Yeah, you don't even need to. But, you know, this meme, is this is just a meme. Just ignore. This is just a meme. Like, literally. Somebody made this as a meme. Just don't worry about it. Um, but, yeah. It's, it's really wild just how anti-union the United States is. It's wild. So, with that in mind, I want to talk about some other union and labor history here in the United States. 
that a lot of people don't talk about. So the first one that we're going to talk about is the Battle of Blair Mountain. Yeah? Let me just bring up some images here. <sighs> Let me just get this for you real quick. We're going to bring this up. I mean, this is a little wild off, right off the get-go. But um, here, we'll zoom in on this one. We're going to go like that. Here we go. This is nice. Let's get cozy. Because, um, oh, hey, my document. You can't see my document. That'll spoil. Here we go. <laughs> this is a newspaper from the Washington Times. Air fleet ordered to WV to West Virginia battlefield. Eee, yikers, huh? Let's talk about the Battle of Blair Mountain. So we talked about the Pinkertons. We talked about what they tended to do. And now we're going to talk about the Battle of Blair Mountain. This was the single largest labor uprising in the history of the United States. Over 100 workers were killed by a combination of the United States National Guard um, and private security soldiers, some of whom were indeed Pinkertons, um, many of whom um, were um, belonged to a group known as let me just grab this here. I, I always forget their um, their name. Baldwin Feltz Detective Agency, an organization that functioned very, very similar to the Pinkertons, but basically the exact same layout. There was a lot of crossover between them. Um, and yeah, so they were the primary actor in Blair Mountain, but it has been confirmed since then, this was many long, long time ago, that there were indeed Pinkertons there. Hey, Hannah Reloaded, thank you so very, very much for the raid. Welcome to all of the incoming raiders. Hannah, thank you so very much. Um, please, everyone who's just arrived, please shoot me a follow if you'd like to. We are talking about American labor history, the history you've never heard of. We're talking about the wars that you've never heard of. Did you know that America had a war on our own land over coal? We're going to talk about that. We're also going to learn about the Pinkertons. Also, feel free, just, you know, just since you've all arrived, I'm going to drop my YouTube link in chat. We're doing a lot of stuff on YouTube. Please feel free to, um, oops, I did the wrong thing again. YouTube, please um, feel free to uh, sub to my YouTube as well because I put my videos up on YouTube if you can't catch them here. Thank you very much for the YouTube subscription, Vork Void. Deeply appreciate it. Um, yeah, happy to have you all here. So what have we talked about so far? I'm just going to give you all a brief um, catch up since all of you wonderful new viewers have arrived. We talked about the Pinkertons. The Pinkertons are a private security firm that still exists to this day. They are owned by another firm you might know called Securitas. You've probably seen them at the mall. They wear uh, gray uniforms with three red circles on it. You've probably seen it. Um... Yes, the Pinkertons, they, they hate unions. They really hate unions. They are strike busters, indeed. They're vicious strike busters. In fact, they've literally killed people. They've literally opened fire on strikes in order to kill people. This is an organization that still exists and operates in America to this day. In fact, their headquarters are uh, in Michigan, in Ann Arbor. Weird, isn't it? Yeah. Um, you're picturing an elf on a shelf? <laughs> what? What? Yeah, so um, the Pinkertons are wild. And we were talking about the Pinkertons because there was this thing that happened a couple days ago in Denver, Colorado. Um, and and uh, a bunch of people like Andy Nyo, you might know the name Andy Nyo, Tim Pool, maybe you might know that name. Um, you might know the name Ian Miles Chong. A bunch of these, um, oh, that's true. In in That is true. In Bioshock Infinite, um, Booker DeWitt was a Pinkerton. So that's interesting. Hey, thank you so much for the gifted subs, figuratively nobody. Welcome all of you who just were gifted subs and thank you so very much for being here. Figuratively nobody, thank you very much for the gifted subs. And the great great news about getting a sub to me right now is when the website launches, which it will be very soon, you will have a subscription to the website, which means tons of emotes. Website's not up yet, but it will be soon and your subscriptions to this channel will get you a free subscription to the website automatically. So bam you're already in love that makes me feel great so thank you for that i'm glad you're here we're talking about all kinds of stuff um i'm working with white nervosa yeah um just waiting to hear back for her at this point so hopefully 
Um, it, we were aiming to get it this weekend. Maybe it'll be a little bit a little bit later this week. We'll see. I'll keep you all updated on the website. Don't you worry about that. Um, gotta panic steal names on the site. Yeah, you gotta get in there. It's all right. We'll make sure it all works out. Um, yeah. H H H H H. I think you'll have a wonderful time. Um. Yeah, and also feel free to follow my YouTube as well. I put videos up um, usually two, uh, two or three times a week that are like, um, you know, edited segments from here. So if you can't catch a stream, you can always catch it there. Um, and I also put up VODs of my debates, which I do a lot of. I do a bunch of cool debates, real high energy stuff, grilling the hell. In fact, unfortunately, um, recently I was going to debate a Proud Boy. Oh, it was going to be great, but... Twitch TOS made it impossible for us to talk to Proud Boys on this site. RIP Proud Boys! Not allowed on the site anymore. But we'll be talking about that in the future, and the debate may happen on YouTube. So we'll see. We will see. Anyway, to get back to the point at hand, we were talking about the Pinkertons. The reason why we were talking about the Pinkertons is because a Pinkerton shot a guy in Denver, like, a few days ago. And we were like, what the fuck? And a bunch of right-wing grifters like Andy Nyo and Ian Miles Chong and and uh, a bunch of people along this line, Tim Pool, you might know some of these people. Those people reported that it was an Antifa member who shot someone, but it couldn't have been farther from the truth. In fact, it was confirmed to be somebody who worked for the Pinkertons. Yeah, it was a Pinkerton. It was indeed. Pinkertons, the Pinkerton um, Detective Agency, as it used to be called, no longer called that. Now it is... Pinkerton Corporate Risk Management. Um, those people are still operating to this day. And as it turns out, there was one who was hired by a news agency, got in a kerfluffle with some back the blue guy. The back the blue guy sprayed him in the face with mace and he shot the guy. Wild, huh? Wild. Yeah. Pinkertons are indeed still a thing. Many people are surprised to go to look again. I said this earlier, but you look at the calendar and you go, my God, 2020, the Pinkertons in 2020, more like 1920. Am I right? <laughs> but as it turns out, we have a lot more in common with the 1920s than we like to think. Things haven't changed all that much as it turns out. Yeah, Antifa is an easy cop-out to mislead uninformed people. And people like Tim Pool and Andy Neo use this all the time. And then they, they bank on the fact that people won't check for uh, story updates. They'll just retweet the initial story. Um, and yeah, and it happens. They, they do this all the time. They hear one person. They'll cite any source. It doesn't matter the credibility of the source. If they can find one source that says... Um, hey, that, that was an Antifa person. They'll cite that source and then they'll blame the source instead of themselves for propagating that information. Despite the fact that they are the, they are supposed journalists who should be reporting on this. If the source exists, it's, it must be true. And they did this this time as well. Andy Neo, who reported this wildly, he reported it on his website, which was then cited by tons of other right-wing grifters, and a, a whole wave of misinformation went out, and then Andy Ngo was like, well, I was just citing the, the, the policeman who said that it was an Antifa person. Whoops. You thought it was from the late 1800s as a relic from the Civil War. You, well... You would be surprised. Some relics are still kicking around. Indeed, they were founded 170 years ago, which is, you know, a long time for an organization to exist. But they're still kicking. Yeah. Aw, thank you so much, Kanawichi. And thank you all for the bits. I thought it was from the... Yeah, yeah sorry. I already read that one. Thank you so much for um for all of the donos and generosity um, and all the follows. Happy to have you here. I hope you'll uh, come join me again in the future. We're going to keep going. We just started. So you all came in at the perfect time. You're going to get a whole... A whole scroll of, of, of history. And then we're going to laugh at PragerU. So if you like Prager, if you like laughing at PragerU, if you like PragerU, you might be on the wrong channel. But if you like laughing at PragerU, you'll probably have fun with what we're going to be doing today. But first, we got to get through this labor history. So that's why we were talking about the Pinkertons. Um, yeah, the Pinkertons still kicking around today, still working as a part of Securitas, whole lot of shit like that. And now we got to talk about something else. Because there are, have been groups like the Pinkertons that have operated throughout history here. The history of American labor relations is not a nice one. It's not a clean one. But 
there's a lot of inspiration and learning that can be gained from it. So, let's talk about the Battle of Blair Mountain. The Battle of Blair Mountain occurred in 1921. Hey, thank you. I appreciate that, D Dadel Dan. I really appreciate that. I try to bring a lot of energy to every stream that I do. I want people to be interested. I sell myself to all of you as a political edutainer, and that's what I aim to do every time. Entertain you. Uh, entertain you. Um, do we have to restart? No, we don't really. We just started. Yeah. Um, I try to entertain you and also give you the seeds so that you can begin to grow your own political knowledge even more. That's my aim every day. Powered by caffeine. Blair Mountain, where Blair White was born? I don't think so. For some reason, I have a feeling that, that Blair White grew up a little more bougie than Blair, than Blair Mountain, West Virginia. The Battle of Blair Mountain occurred in 1921. So, damn, almost 100 years ago. It's a long time ago. Still relevant to this day. Again, the single largest labor uprising in the history of the United States. In the Battle of Blair Mountain, 100 workers were killed by a combination of National Guard soldiers and private security soldiers, some of whom were these Pinkertons that we were talking about just recently. Most of them, however, belonged to an organization known as Baldwin Felts, which was very similar in structure to the Pinkertons. They were an intelligence and security private organization that would work for oil barons, in this case, coal barons, steel barons. They would work for giant industrial capitalists who owned massive monopolies at the time. In Blair, uh, in, in West Virginia, um, there was this thing going on at the time um, called a company town. Have you ever heard of the concept of a company town? Anybody in chat, if you know what this is, you're going to have a fun time with this. Um, Blackwater, they're not, as far as I know, they're not related to Blackwater, but Blackwater functions on the same idea, except Blackwater goes into war zones as opposed to domestically. Although, as I understand it, there has been some use of Blackwater um, recently. Um, yeah, if you've ever heard of the term company towns, this is something that people learn about, and they learn about it as like a thing of the past, which is kind of true, but also kind of not true, because it, certain practices still do happen to this day. But for those who don't know, a company town was um, basically there would be a coal like a a, um, a coal deposit found by a corporation. So they'd buy a bunch of land, they'd buy the mineral rights to a bunch of land, they'd find the coal, and then they would build a mine there. Around the mine, they would build they would build a whole bunch of houses, they would build a whole bunch of stores, they would build a whole bunch of stuff, and this town would appear that was built entirely by a corporation that has millions and millions and billions of dollars um oh is there a, is there a is there another song about this we might be able to listen to that in a little bit that'd be great yeah 16 tons hey that's a good one we'll listen to that afterwards that's uh that should be um yeah i think we can listen to that actually um because it's a public public um what's it called it's in the public domain um yeah, so there was these, they would build these towns around their coal mine that was completely owned by the company. The houses were owned by the company, the stores were owned by the company, and of course, now they would, they would, they would have a, a mayor because, you know, when you charter a town, you can't literally, you can't literally own the town, but they would own the town. They would own everything in the town. Um, and w what's funny is that they would also, own the stores there. They could charge whatever they wanted, and sometimes they would literally use a company currency. So, you would go to work, and you would be paid a wage, but you would also be paid a whole bunch in a company currency that could only be used at company stores. And um, there's actually a depiction of this in um, the uh, really famous John Steinbeck novel, The Grapes of Wrath where they go to a company store and they try to buy food and their company money that they got can only buy them um, flour. That's it, just flour So they and a little bit of oil. So they buy flour and they eat fry bread, which has no nutrition, and there's an entire tent city of people basically surviving on fry bread with no nutrition. So people are dying of malnutrition. Yeah, it's terrible. Um... Yeah, if you own the land, you own all the property. Yeah, you, I mean, you can't own the actual town, 
but you can own the town. And these were called company towns. As it turns out, they were very common at this point in history, just a hundred years ago. Not very long if you think about it. So West Virginia had a whole bunch of company towns, right? And then something happened. They tried to unionize, right? So the workers were working in absolutely horrific conditions. There were a series of mine collapses and mine explosions that occurred in West Virginia at this time that were the result of horrible workplace conditions. Lots of workers were dying in these mines. Um, in fact, it's still to this day, I lived in West Virginia for a while. I can tell you this. It's still to this day, a cultural part of West Virginia to have a shower in your garage or in your basement. Do you know why? Because when you come home from working in the mines, you will be covered in soot. You'll be covered in, in, um, in, in coal dust. And so literally to this day, many houses in West Virginia that you buy will have a shower in the garage or in the basement. And if you're from out of that area, you might be like, what the fuck is this about? Well, it's because so many people lived and worked in coal, uh, in and around coal mines, that it became a culture, like a cultural norm, to have a, a shower outside of your normal house, so you wouldn't bring any coal dust in. Coal dust is really, really bad for your lungs. In fact, it can give you a condition that we know as the black lung. Black lung, you know, like you cough up your lung because it's coated in in years and years of coal dust, and it gives you cancer, and then you die. Um, yeah. So that's something that happens in, uh, it's still to this day, a, a part of West Virginia culture. Pretty wild, huh? Um, all your family on your mother's side works for DuPont in Parkersburg in w Virginia. Yeah, DuPont. Oh boy, let's not even get into DuPont. American chemical companies are monstrous. In Pittsburgh, they have showers in the basement. Yes, that that's another thing. P yeah, Pittsburgh is in Pennsylvania, right near, right near West Virginia. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um... So yeah, let's keep talking about this a little more. Um, so here's the thing. The, the West Virginia coal miners tried to unionize against these horrible work conditions. They tried to unionize because they literally were dying. They were dying in their own homes. They had really bad living conditions in company-owned apartments. Their rent would go to the company. Their food money would go to the company. And they would get really bad wages to begin with. So they tried to unionize under, oh, let me just read this real quick. Oh, why couldn't I see that? Oh, that's weird. Ah, the heir to the DuPont fortune got away with assaulting his three-year-old daughter. Uh, that doesn't surprise me. That doesn't surprise me, to be honest, Winchanter, but good to know. We might do a DuPont stream another time. Um, yeah. Oh, I'm glad you're having fun, noob monster. I'm, I always try to bring a lot of energy. Um, I'm really glad you're having fun. Um, so here's what happened. The West Virginia coal miners tried to unionize and this was met with a really, really, I know about that one, Mabaray. I know about that one. This unionization effort was met with an absolutely wild crackdown. Let me just give you some ideas of the sort of crackdown we're talking about here. Um, what would, what was set up was once they found out about union activity in the area, all of the West Virginia mines, all of the corporate corporations that operated the West Virginia mines agreed to start firing any union work, anybody they found out who was thinking about joining the union. If you even thought about joining the union, they would fire you. Um, oh shit, that's wild. I'll check that out afterwards. They would fire you if you tried to join the union. They would refuse to hire anyone known to be associated with the union. And the way that they found out about this, um, the, uh, the way that they found out about this was, um, through groups like the Pinkertons. They would have, uh, they would hire private investigators to go in and join the union or sneak into the union and just listen and find out who was associated with the union so that the corporation could fire them. Now, as you know, we have some labor protection laws um, it, nowadays that you can't just be fired for anything because there's unemployment and there's all kinds of stuff, which made it, it's made it slightly, um, slightly more difficult for them just to fire you. But they still do this to this day and many companies will fire you. In fact, it happened as recently as a few months ago, I don't even remember the exact date, uh, Amazon has fired you organizers who uh, who tried to um, fight back against their really bad COVID 
um, response. As we know, Amazon infamously had like 19,000 cases of COVID among their workers, and they fired the people who organized um, a walkout in order to get better COVID care because they weren't being given PPE. There wasn't hand sanitizer on site. They weren't being told to wear masks. And Amazon fired those people who, who, who whistle blew about it. Yeah, it's absolutely wild. Now they have to find other reasons, but they can still um, they can still do it. Yeah, a lot of Pinkertons eventually became the U.S. Secret Service, and then shortly afterwards, a law was passed barring the government from hiring anyone anyone associated with the Pinkertons. So it's kind of weird. Um, oh, that's a good idea. Bezos is making more money um, than ever right now. What a massive cunt! I agree. I agree. Very much agree. Um, so here's what, what happened. So in addition to it beginning to fire anyone uh, associated with the union in any way in, in West Virginia, um, this was um, largely in Logan and Mingo counties of West Virginia, where the mines were. So uh, they would fire you. They refused to hire any union workers, which meant that West Virginia company towns were full of people who previously worked at the mines, who had now been fired and had nowhere to go. Because as it turns out, you can't just move when you've been fired from your job for attempting to fight the horrible conditions of your job. That is true, Rakasan. I, I would agree with you to a certain degree on that. Um, we'll get into that a little more afterwards. Then there was a really, really big success, right? So as this problem got worse, Worse and worse and worse. More and more union organizers from around the country were going to West Virginia. And that includes Mother Jones. Um, that includes uh, the guy, one of the guys who was involved in there was a guy whose name was Billy Blizzard, I think his name was. A lot of really famous, um, like, firebrand union organizers who went around and said, this is bullshit. You all shouldn't be dying in the mine so that somebody can make a dime. That's horrible. Um, and they stood up. Uh, and after a particularly good rally, there was a, a labor rally that resulted in 3,000 new union miners. The companies decided to fire all of them. Wild, huh? 3,000 workers in rural West Virginia. I think it's hard to comprehend how many people that was. And keep in mind, if you're evicted, I mean, if you're fired from the company town, or from the, sorry, if you're fired from your job and you live in a company town, you're out of house. Your family is out of house. And you might not even be able to buy food in town because all of the stores are also owned by the company. You are functionally more dead than even these days from losing your job. And in fact, they hired a private army to evict people. That's how bad it got. They fired 3,000 workers. And then hired the Baldwin Feltz Detective Agency, a private security company, to go and um, evict the fired miners and their families. That's pretty wild. Obviously, this prompted um, this prompted a lot, a lot of uh, of reaction. Like people were real mad about this, so they started to strike. A lot of workers started to strike. Now, let's just talk about some of the things that happened um, in the buildup to Blair, the Battle of Blair Mountain, the most famous incident of this particular coal war. And this was considered a coal war because keep in mind that while it first started between companies and workers, later the U.S. government joined in. The U.S. Army was involved in fighting miners in America, American workers. We have these rights that we have now because of the union efforts that happened over the last 100 years. That's why, noob monster, and everyone here who's listening to this should be aware that the rights that you have now are guaranteed because of the labor workers and organizers of the past, many of whom paid for this with their lives. And we don't even have that many protections still because they've been stripped away thanks to Reaganomics and, de and uh, deregulation, regulatory capture, et cetera, et cetera. So keep that in mind that the future, if we want better labor rights in the future, we have to be willing to fight for them. We have to be willing to push for them. And 
Part of being able to push for them means knowing the history of labor in this country. So with that in mind, um, this group, Baldwin Feltz, did, was, was really, really aggressive. So, um, they, they went into the towns, they went into a company that one of the most famous examples was they went into a town and attempted to bribe a mayor to, but they, they offered him $500, which at the time is quite a lot of money, quite a lot. They offered him $500 to allow them to install machine gun nests on the buildings in the town that the state owned. They wanted to be able to put machine guns on top of buildings in the town, in the residential area, a private security company. Can you imagine if a bunch of mall cops came into your town and, and tried to bribe your mayor to allow them to put machine gun nests on top of your house, on top of the state buildings? Can you imagine that? That happened here in America. Yeah, um, this happened in 1921. H, 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 H. So yeah, you can try and find a conversion. Yeah. That's the sort of thing that we were dealing with at the time and that these these strikers were dealing with. Thankfully, the mayor of the town said fuck no because he was, in this case, very favorable to the miners, which is kind of rare, but he was probably a miner at one point himself. It would be more like Blackwater than mall cops. True. Yeah, 7,260. Yeah. Isn't this wacky? Well, guess what? There's even more of it. We're going to talk about this. Yeah. So... They attempted to bribe this mayor um, to install the machine gun nest. Didn't work. Here's what happened. When the evictions began, because, again, the miners were striking. So the miners would go out in front of the mine, and they would refuse to work. They would show up on the premises, and they wouldn't work. They would hold picket signs. They would do strike stuff. You know, you strike. But their wives and children would be at home. So what the Baldwin Feltz Detective Agency did is they waited until workers went to the strike and then they tried to evict the families while the workers were away and couldn't defend their families. Um, this eviction happened at gunpoint, mind you. The first, some of the first evictions were uh, literally bam, 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 pounding on your door. A bunch of armed guards said, get the fuck out of here. You've been evicted. You no longer work for the company. You can't work here. Get the fuck out. Yeah, they don't teach any of this in U.S. history classes. It's it's a matter of public record. This is historical fact. This is not some made-up thing. This is not some conspiracy theory. This is easily accessible. You can go find literally newspaper articles from the time talking about all of this. You're voting for Trump just saying, okay, your loss. It's your own loss. How embarrassing. Um, Yeah, that's your loss. Um, yeah, today's the, yeah, it was only recently that I myself learned of the Cold Wars being an actual war. I always thought it was just referred to as that, but no, they were actually a war. Um, so yeah, so now here's what's, what started the, the chunk of the events. Um, basically, um, this was what this was what led to it. In one of the towns in West Virginia, there was a gunpoint eviction of a woman and her children. And what happened was, uh, they were like literally the 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 women and children, the women, the woman and her children would refuse to leave. They were like, "We're not leaving our home. Get the fuck away. Um, we don't care. You're gonna have to shoot us if you want us to leave." And so these hired thugs literally broke into the house and started taking their things and throwing them into the street. A local um, police officer or police chief who was slightly favorable to the miners came in and said, what the fuck are you guys doing over here? He's like, what the fuck? You can't just throw these people's shit into the streets. And the um, the representative of Baldwin Feltz, this private security guy, said, we have a warrant for this eviction. So the police chief took the warrant, looked at it and said, this is bullshit. And he threw it away. And then... They got really mad. Those private security guys got really mad and they aggressed on the police and the police fired back. So this is where the bloodshed started. And in fact, as it turns out, one of the people who was there on hand evicting those workers was the brother of the CEO of the security company. Yeah, it was a police chief, not a sheriff. 
We're going to talk about the sheriffs. But yeah, it was a police chief, actually, in this case. Um, and he deputized a whole bunch of miners um, in the town to help him because these thugs were literally coming in and throwing people's shit out on the road. So they shot at each other. And one of the guys who got killed in it was the brother of the CEO of the security company. Now you can see where this is starting to go. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Yeah. So, then what basically happened is, and I don't want to go into like every single detail, but a whole bunch of strikes started occurring all over this part of the state. There was strikes being organized in different towns. Um, there were clashes between the police. There were crap clashes between um, the security organizations and miners. Now, keep in mind, a lot of these miners had guns, just so you know. This is rural West Virginia in 1921. Nearly all of them had guns. They all had guns. So there were armed, three different armed belligerents involved. You know what I mean? Uh, belligerents is the wrong word, but three different armed organizations involved. You had armed union miners. You had armed private security who were hired by the owners of the mines to break the strike at any cost necessary. Because keep in mind, coal was desperately needed for power at this point in time. Coal was desperately important. So striking miners means the entire United States is low on coal. Even if it's only for a short time, that could choke an entire country. If your country loses the ability to fuel boats, to fuel vehicles, to fuel power plants, bam. Yeah, powder keg isn't even a strong enough term. More like a, like a it's like a nuclear, it's like a it's like a a, a neutrino star. Like just seething as a powder keg. And then it got even worse because President Warren Harding, who was president at the time, threatened to send in federal troops and bombers. Does this sound familiar to you? Like you all, we mo we're all roaming back in time into 1921 bullshit, you know, whatever, fuck. What, who was king back then? The pharaohs? Oh my God, right? Wait a second though. Today, we got a president who's doing the same shit. Don't we? Kind of weird that today, in 2020, we have a president who's doing the same exact shit that led to a massacre in the past. And in fact, Donald Trump went further and actually did call in federal troops. Federal troops have been on the ground in Portland. They've been on the ground in uh, not in Seattle, actually, but they've been on the ground in Portland. They've been on the ground in Chicago. They've been on the ground in Washington, D.C. He actually went there where Warren Harding did not. They sent the army to attack the miners, Mitchell, not the security force. And in fact, this is where it gets really wild, is that as the tensions increased and as they were fighting back and forth and as the country grew more desperate for coal... West Virginia National Guard, which is a part of the U.S. Army, joined forces with the private army. And in fact, it got to the point where the powder keg exploded. And this is was known as the Battle of Blair Mountain. The Battle of Blair Mountain occurred on Oct on, sorry, on August 25th. Damn. Really, we're like one year away from it. Like one year and two months. It occurred on August 25th. And a anti-union sheriff by the name of Don Chaffin um, was given a, a massive amount of money, finances, weapons, and, tr and bodies, you know, private security guys, by the corporate owners of the mines. Um, and was supported by the National Guard. So the National Guard, a private army that was funded by corporate owners of the mines, yeah, Don, yeah, it's weird, um, joined, up, joined up behind anti-union sheriff Don Schaffen and attacked the striking mine workers. It was so bad. I'm just going to give you some facts um, about this situation. Over one million rounds of ammunition were fired across the Battle of Blair Mountain. It got to the point where it was about uh, it was about a ten day battle 
that this battle went on for 10 days. There were there are photos you can find. Let me see if I can find one right now. I didn't save this one because I didn't know if we would get to this particular point once again. Um, let me just see if I can find this picture because I want to show you. It's it's really uh it, it really is uh interesting. Let me just see if I can get this real quick. If I can find that picture I was looking at. Yeah, here we go. Take a look at this. Let me just bring this up. Take a look at this. This is a picture of a minor sniper nest that was set up on the side of the mountains. Look at that. Miners hanging out with a machine gun ready to defend their, uh, their fucking town. These miners blockaded railroads. They blockaded roads. They built uh, security checkpoints, etc. Yeah, it got that bad because the literal army was marching on them. Yeah, look at that. Damn, damn, great, great grandpa. Look at that. Whew. He's got the, that, that, uh, that, that badonkadonk. Listen, that's a little bit objectifying, all right? Listen, listen. We're here to look. You're supposed to be looking at this part, not this part, but I know y'all horny motherfuckers. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that guy even died. Who knows? <laughs> what real, this, this is what a real man looks like. These two guys hanging out in a bush with a machine gun fighting for their rights. There we go. <laughs> nah, listen, they these guys, you think these guys wouldn't wouldn't be afraid to pee in the woods? Come on. Team gun versus team cheek. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Union Granddaddy. Yeah, uh, Clinton, yeah. The Democratic Party has abandoned unions functionally, so they're not a labor party. Um, yeah, they never bring up. It's funny. Sometimes they do. It's really weird. Conservatives in like West Virginia, they have to pander um, to a certain degree to this history because this history is well known in places like West Virginia, just not everywhere else. I don't know. There isn't things much sexier than people fighting for their rights in solidarity with their fellow workers. True. We had a labor party, kind of. We didn't really, but the Democrats were at one point considered the de facto labor party because unions almost universally worked with the Democratic Party, but not so much anymore. That's not really the case anymore. So yeah, um, basically what ended up happening is there was just absolute warfare for about 10 days. Um, and at the Battle of Blair Mountain, an enormous contingent of of miners, of striking miners, marched towards a t uh, towards Blair Mountain. Um, and what ended up happening was the National Guard and the private security forces struck first before the rest of the miners from the rest of the region could get there. So they were crushed, totally crushed. Again, over a hundred workers were killed um, by a combination of United uh, United States National Guard and private security forces. One hundred. Democrats highly encourage unions. Dems highly encourage workers' rights. Dems highly encourage raising misery. Listen, um, they don't highly do any of those things. They do occasionally, but they really, really haven't pushed for it very strongly in recent years. Um, and and Biden, Biden even, which I advocate for you voting for Biden, just for the record, um, they don't highly back unions. I mean, that's probably true, but keep in mind that certain unions... Um, have literally been bought out by massive corporate interests. It's, it's yeah, there are some unions, of course, but this that's the thing. You can deal with a bad union. Yeah, Biden is a right-leaning Democrat. Yeah, I, I agree. What the fuck are you talking about? Listen, we got shit to talk about, all right? And yes, unions do reflect their membership. Unions are not perfect by any means. No, no one has ever advocated that here. But unions are an important part of a healthy labor economy simply true uh which we don't have here uh workers in america are completely cucked totally cucked cucked to cucked sake like just cucked to hell yep well and also there's other problems with police unions a police union is advocating against against its own uh its own constituency so the police union is, a re is representing and protecting the police from the the organization that it that is supposed to be able to determine it. It's an anti-democratic thing, you see, because a police union is advocating against the voters who should otherwise control the police. Pull up the uh, Radio Lab episode of the Auto Workers Union in the 1970s. Maybe, maybe another time. We're not talking about that right now. 
Police unions are used against other city unions. Yes, that is true. They do do that. Anyway, Battle of Blair Mountain. Over a million rounds of ammunition were fired, and the strikers were crushed at Blair Mountain because they were not prepared to be um, sort of jumped in on and and rushed on. Um, however, however, uh, in fact, it was so bad that um, you can actually find, this is really funny, this is a random factoid, but they are still finding caches of weapons or caches of weapons that are hidden in the woods of West Virginia because once the, when, when they routed, when when all of the striking workers were come upon by the National Guard and private security forces, they obviously, you know, broke and fled. And many of them ran home to where they were going and they would hide their weapons in the woods because if they got caught, it wouldn't, they would be like, oh, I wasn't armed. I wasn't armed. Um, oh, a factoid doesn't mean a small fact. It means something false that sounds like a fact. Is that really? Oh, I didn't know that. I guess that makes sense. Um, oh, well, good luck, Gina. I hope you have a great day. Thanks for being here when you could. Um, yeah, I didn't know that either. Huh, interesting. Well, I'll keep that in mind. Anyway, tiny fact. Um, yeah, so there are still caches being found today of weapons that were hidden as workers were fleeing from, um, from the uh, attack on Blair Mountain. But 100 workers were killed and over 1,000 workers were arrested. Now... Many of those workers who were arrested were later acquitted because, um, as it turns out, they had a really good reason to be striking, but many of them rotted in prison for years and years and years just for participating in a strike, just for participating in an attempt to change their, their, um, uh, their material conditions for the better when they were being exploited disgustingly. So there's the history of, there's a brief history of Blair Mountain. And it's pretty wild, isn't it, huh? It's pretty wild to think that we had a literal, like a literal battle, an actual battle with the American military against workers who were striking. And all the company had to do, it's not like the company had to do anything other than listen to the demands, but they were against the ability of these people to even organize. The, the, the companies were so devoted to their profits because they were making so much money. Keep in mind, they were making enough money from these ventures that they could prop up towns and still be profitable. They could just build a town and it would make them money because they would be collecting rent, they would be collecting money from coal, they would be collecting money from the, the, the stores. Endless. And none of these, and they had no benefits. These these people would get no vacation time. They would rarely ever see their families. They would work sometimes 14 hours days, 14 hour days for no pay. Their children would go to work in the mines at a young age, sometimes as early as 16. And that was just 100 years ago. And we're seeing the same things happening today. Hmm, interesting. Huh, I didn't know that. That's actually, that is an interesting fact, tiny fact. There are lots of books about this. Um, lots and lots of them. The Everett Massacre. Oh, we can talk about the Everett Massacre. I didn't even think to do this one. The Everett Massacre, also known as Bloody Sunday, was an armed confrontation between local authorities and the members of the IWW, sometimes called Wobblies. Yeah, the IWW wouldn't know anything about that. Um, took place in Everett, Washington in 1916. It marked a time of rising tensions in the in the Pacific Northwest labor history. Hey, a lot of them were immigrants. That is true. Many, many, many of these workers were immigrants. Either um, many of them were Irish immigrants, many of them were Greek immigrants. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty wild. Factoid, a brief or trivial item of news or information. It looks like there is a very... Thank you for the bits, by the way. Thank you very much, all of you who have contributed bits. That's very... It's very interesting that these words can have almost... Almost opposite meanings. Strange. Let me just grab a sip of my water real... Or my soda real quick. Now, keep in mind... A thing... In fact, look at this. Even here... Um... Even here, uh, in this in this article about the Everett massacre that was nicely sh uh, shared with me, look at this. They called them anarchists at the time. 
more than 200 vigilantes or citizen deputies under the ostensible authority of Snohomish County Sheriff McRae met in order to repel the quote-unquote anarchists. Weird how that term is used throughout history over and over and over again to represent anybody who stands up for their workers' rights. Weird. It's weird, isn't it? And it's like it keeps going on to this day. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's truth in that too, um, Ace. Um, but yeah, um, they call people anarchists. Remember Donald Trump? We watched this clip the other day. Remember Donald Trump talking about the anarchists, the 250 anarchists took over uh, 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 25% of the city. Remember that? Absolutely wild. It's the same thing. They're using the same exact tactics that were used against labor organizers in the past. Whether or not those people were actually anarchists, if you were against the corporations, you got labeled as an anarchist. They use that as a spooky boogeyman term to justify harming you. Still going on to this day. Yeah, Antifa is, used, is being used similarly. They will never say anti-fascists. They will say Antifa because then people don't think about what it is that people who, you know, who consider themselves anti-fascists are standing against. What will be the next one? Who knows? They'll probably keep using anarchists. They still use it now. I mean, but that's the thing. Climate activists have already been labeled anarchists. They label anybody. Anybody who disagrees with the, the mass exploitation gets labeled as an anarchist. Well, the thing is, I don't think we could have helped that, unfortunately. You're wrong about that, Cousin Shaq. Maybe you'd like to debate about it. Would you like to debate about that, Cousin Shaq? I don't know. All this talk of a labor battle has me itching for a fight. You want to come on here, Cousin Shaq? Oh, sarcasm. Okay. You almost had me going. I was doing this face. I was starting to do this one. I was starting to do this. Starting to do the mauled. Ah! Damn, it's all right. We might get one yet. We might get one yet. Don't you worry. No, I didn't fire. I was just ready. The debate face. Ah! Yeah. Anarchists are far less scary than the people trying to kill them for political differences. I'm not even an anarchist. It's really funny because historically, there's like barely any anarchists who were the type of anarchists that, that get framed today. People are like anarchists and they imagine immediately like a guy with a Molotov or, or blowing shit up. And it's really funny because most anarchists throughout history have been like farmers and 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 like d g grocery delivery groups. It's really ridiculous. People like anarchists have the worst rap in history. Like most anarchists historically have just been people who like went and were like, we're making a commune. We're going to bake bread together. Yeah. <sighs> oh. You have dinner time to attend to, as I am asked to make cruelty-free gay waffle fries. Waffle fries are very good. Oops, my anarchy symbol.